This video is supported by Curiosity Stream. You know, good things often come unexpectedly. Just in the past few weeks, SpaceX Starlink project accelerated and are now very much on track. What's odd about how these events unraveled is that most of the media seem to have underestimated the gravity of Starlink project. I personally think that this could lead to a global reshuffle of telco players, which I explained in a previous strategy video, Starlink Satellite 101, I'll link it down below. But for this video, I want to focus on all the technical aspects of Starlink that are designed to make this project a reality. Throughout this video, I'm going to try to answer some questions we all want to know. So without further delay, let's start. The official plan of Starlink project is to send around 1,600 satellites to the 550 kilometers orbit, 2,800 to the 1,150 kilometers orbit, and over 7,000 to the 340 kilometers orbit. The official timeline is unclear for now. Wikipedia says all 12,000 satellites will be deployed by 2027. All we know is that FCC's approval of Starlink is conditional on SpaceX finishing sending half of its 4,400 satellites constellation by April 2024, and the remaining by 2027. As for the 7,500 satellites, similar deadline applies. This means from now on, SpaceX need to perform 5 to 10 Starlink launches per year to be on schedule. This is based on the assumption that every launch places 60 satellites in orbit and all satellite functions normally as expected. In reality, of course, there would be faulty satellites that require replacement and tuning. If Falcon Heavy and BFR takes over sometimes in the future, more satellites can be launched per trip as well. But as a general guideline, if there are 7 Starlink launches like this per year, SpaceX is on schedule to comply with FCC license for the initial 4,400 satellites. As for the 7,500 satellites, it would be very impressive if SpaceX can keep up with the schedule because that requires SpaceX to triple the launch and production rate of Starlink satellites. It is important to note that with six more launches pushing the number of satellites to above 400, SpaceX would have a minor coverage. And with 12 more launches or 800 satellites, SpaceX could achieve a moderate coverage of the world. An interesting thing to note is that if we're talking about just the North American market, six launches should have established six orbital planes that covers the entire United States and Canada, which should be a priority for Starlink businesses. SpaceX has made many firsts with this Starlink launch. It is the heaviest payload SpaceX has ever launched at 18.5 tons, it is the most numerous payload SpaceX has ever launched, and this is also the first launch of production-designed Starlink satellites. Here's a picture of all 60 satellites stacked on top of one another. They almost fill the entire Falcon 9 payload bay. And if we compare this Tesla Roadster, we can get a good sense of its size. In total, SpaceX plans to send a combined 12,000 satellites that transmit signals in K above, K under and B band frequencies. Once it's finished, SpaceX will have a three dimensional network of satellites talking with one another, optimizing internet quality for us. This is very important because, if anything, Starlink is not one constellation, but three, at very distances dedicated to making sure our internet experience is uninterrupted and of high quality. At very distances also means those satellites higher up might cover your area for longer time but at higher latency. It could be used during transition between two satellites that are lower in orbit. These type of networks are called mesh networks that are not hierarchical like our current internet infrastructure, but is supposedly more efficient. This could also be used for optimization based on functions of the internet. If a user is watching TV, in which case information transmission is one way, satellites at higher altitude could be used for its stable connection. However, when a user is playing computer games, satellites at lower altitude should be activated because of the much lower latency. Three constellations of satellites working in concert with one another give us the optimum internet experience wherever we are. Finally, the initial Starlink satellites will be orbiting at a 53 degree inclination and each satellite will weigh 227 kilograms, which is 500 pounds. And another thing that has gotten a lot of media attention is its whole effect ion thruster and its usage of krypton gas for position adjustment. Xenon is the more commonly used material, but the argument is that krypton is around 75% cheaper than xenon, which could have saved a lot of money for SpaceX in the long run, especially considering the scale of the project. 
The downside of Krypton is that it's less efficient than Xenon. Additionally, 95% of the satellites will quickly deteriorate re-entering Earth. This is a crucial condition for FCC approval since Starlink will increase space debris by a factor of 3 to 4 if they are not burned in the atmosphere. But once the satellites are in the sky, it will communicate with pre-installed ground stations in your house. SpaceX also has that covered. It has filed approval for a million ground stations, which is a suitable capacity for its satellites. Reportedly, one Starlink satellite could simultaneously stream 4K videos to 40,000 people, which means with 1,000 satellites, SpaceX needs 40 million ground stations to fully utilize its capacity. Lastly, there are a few interesting questions I want to touch on. The first one is this, why 550 kilometers orbit? This is a consideration based on optimizing performance and cost. The higher the orbit, the higher the latency, but the lower the orbit, the higher the atmospheric drag. Both side effects are undesirable. Higher latency makes the user experiences laggy and higher atmospheric drag makes it costly to operate satellites. Therefore, SpaceX needs to find a crucial balance between the two. 550 kilometers is the sweet spot for that. Another question I often get is, why 60 satellites? Well, satellites are moving very fast in space. At one moment, Satellite 1 might be covering New York, sending signals to that area. At another moment, Satellite 2 might have taken over, especially at such a low altitude. The number 60 is specific to SpaceX satellites. 60 satellites are required to cover a single orbit plane at the orbit altitude of 550 kilometers. It means one satellite can only cover a small area, all 60 can cover an entire orbit plane of lands, with no empty spaces in between. So here's a big picture of what Starlink means to all of us. If you're living in rural areas without cable options, having a holiday on a cruise ship, flying on a long haul route from New York to Singapore, living in one of those heavily populated areas in India, or you simply don't like your local telco, Starlink could be a better option. Putting aside all the technical jargons and operational difficulties, what users like us need to know is simply that if the plan succeeds, SpaceX would be able to provide a competitive service to telco markets in terms of most specs that are relevant for a good user experience. The only difference is that SpaceX will be offering it on a global scale and SpaceX is not a telco. If you want to know how a satellite is built, do check out our sponsor of today, Curiosity Stream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 2,400 documentaries from some of the world's best filmmakers. One of my favorite space-related videos on Curiosity Stream is this one on how to build a satellite. It is incredibly detailed and insightful and a very opportune suggestion for those of you who love Starlink and what it promises. Definitely a great way to spend some quality time with families on a Saturday afternoon. Other than this episode, Curiosity Stream has an entire section focused on space, so I'm sure you'll have a great time exploring our solar system with their award-winning documentaries. Curiosity Stream offers our audiences a 31-day free trial, so sign up with the link in the description down below with the code Curious Elephant and try it out for free. Once your free trial is up, they charge $19.99 a year, which is only $1.67 a month. So start binge watching and exploring our solar system today with Curiosity Stream.